Here's another SSB transceiver for 7 MHz. While I had great success with the BitX, I wanted something a little bit smaller. This one is roughly similar, but it uses any 602s instead of the all discrete transistor design. In addition, it took advantage of the serendipitous combination of two off the shelf crystal frequencies mixing to produce a usable frequency range in an amateur band. In this case, 16 MHz for the VXO, you can see the two crystals here, mixing with 8.867 MHz for the IF. The difference is 7 MHz, with the actual frequency coverage being 7050 to 7130, which, at least in Australia, is a busy part of the SSB section of the band. A quick look inside the transceiver, there's only two knobs on the front panel, the volume control and the tuning. The tuning uses a potentiometer which adjusts the voltage on the silicon diodes and that forms a VXO along with these two crystals on 16 MHz. The crystal filter is here, that IF is 8.867 MHz, meaning that the difference between it and the 16 MHz is comfortably on the 40 meter band. This board contains the IF stages, the microphone audio stage, this is an NE602 which is the product detector and balance modulator, the crystal for that is at the back, and here's the audio amplifier. This is the 16 MHz VXO, the 8.867 MHz crystal filter, there's also the second NE602 that functions as the first mixer in the receiver and the last mixer in the transmitter. That's the one that does the conversion between the local oscillator of 16 MHz, the IF of 8.867 MHz to the 7 MHz transmitted and received signal. Here's the bandpass filter board. Two of these are for transmit and one for receive. Finally, on the other side of this partition are the RF amplifier stages, a 2N222 and two BD139s. Buried underneath is the transmit receive relay. Here's the Pi network. And here's an RF choke that's only used when you're matching a high impedance antenna. That's in conjunction with the variable capacitor here, which provides an L match. The back panel is the power socket on-off switch, antenna coupler, only used if matching a high impedance antenna, the antenna, that's if you're using an N-fed, or the coax connection, if you're using a 50 ohm antenna. You'll notice the tab here on the outside of the case, that's for the earth connection, if you're using a small counterpoise, along with your N-fed wire. This project was inspired by the Chinese KNQ7A, VXO 7 MHz SSB transceiver. Its VXO range was 20 kHz, which is okay, but if you want to find people on their frequency, essential for search and pounce contest operating, then you need a wider frequency range. This particular rig gives much more, around 80 kHz pulling range. I'm not going to describe the circuit in that much detail, because there's a lot of similar circuits on the web, and I'll provide some links below. However, I will talk about some of the special features used in the circuit, because they might be applicable for other QRP designs. I'll first of all give a broad overview, and then talk about some of the specific stages later. You might be able to find some things in here that could be applied to your projects as well. It's a single band SSB transceiver for 7 MHz. Use is made of simple common ICs, such as the NE602 and LM386. Plus, crystals are used throughout. For the local oscillator, 
the carrier oscillator and also the crystal filter. The local oscillator is at 16 megahertz. The IF is at 8.867 megahertz, which is also a similar frequency to that of the BFO. This is a single conversion circuit. What happens on receive? Incoming signals come from the antenna through this low pass filter, through some relays which provide the transmit receive switching, to a single tuned circuit on 7 MHz. They then present themselves to the first NE602 which is actually a mixer and oscillator. The oscillator in this case being the 16 MHz local oscillator. The difference is the intermediate frequency, or 8.867 MHz, um, bearing in mind that 16 minus 7 is 8.867, so that's our difference. Then it goes to a second NE602, and the purpose of that is to act as a product detector, so it mixes with your local oscillator, which is included in the NE602, the 602 being a mixer oscillator chip, and the difference is at audio frequencies, which is then amplified. Now on transmit, it's the reverse. You've got the transmitted audio from the microphone, goes through an audio preamp. It is mixed in the NE602 with the local oscillator on 8.867 megahertz. That's a double sideband filter at its output. And of course we want single sideband, so it passes through the crystal filter goes to our second NE602 mixer, oscillator. The oscillator for that still on 16 MHz, doesn't change in frequency. Then it goes through, we've got a 7 MHz output here, but it's actually got some other frequencies as well. So we need to pass that through an RF filter. There's two tuned circuits there. And then up here is a chain, a RF amplifier, a driver, power amplifier, which gives us about two watts output. Then our low pass filter and if you're using a high impedance antenna then you've got a option of transforming to a higher impedance with this L match network. Now a little bit more detail. One of the things I wanted on this rig were two separate antenna sockets. One for 50 ohms such as a dipole and one for high impedance such as a half wavelength in fed wire. I didn't want to do any switching and I had limited room on the back panel. So what I did, you can see here, is the conventional Pi Network low pass filter. Connected to that is the normal antenna socket, low impedance. But I've also added an L network that comprises a 6.8 microhenry RF choke. You should use around that value for a seven megahertz transmitter. And then variable capacitor, which goes down to the ground. Now, one thing about this is that if you are using the 50 ohm antenna or you're using a RF power meter, for instance, if you're trying to measure the output power, you must set this capacitor to its minimum capacitance value. Otherwise, it interferes with the rest of the circuit and it actually takes power. For instance, on receive, if you're listening to this and you adjust the variable capacitor at a certain setting, you'll find the signal drops down to almost nothing. That's because the capacitance in series with this inductance presents a low impedance and is effectively a short circuit to the RF. On the other hand, if you're using a half wave length N fed wire, you just leave this antenna socket unconnected to anything, connect your half wave length to here, and then your ground counterpoise if you're using one to this connection. It's simple and easy and allows you to match a range of antenna types without the extra size and weight of an external antenna coupler. In the middle of the picture is a double pole double three relay. That's used for the transmit receive switching. What I've done here is that the push to talk connection on the microphone energizes the relay and moves the contacts into the transmit mode. There's two things we're actually switching with the relay the transmit antenna connection, and that connection comes from the Pi network, which is used in the circuit on both transmit and receive. These sets of relay contacts switch between either the receive input antenna connection or the output of the transmitter power amplifier stage. 
the other connection on this transmit receive relay are the power connections. In this circuit there are some parts that are used on both transmit and receive, i.e. the two NE602 stages, and some that may be exclusively used on transmit or receive only. For instance, the transmit power amplifier and driver stage aren't used on receive, so they can be switched off. Similarly, the receiver audio amplifier is only used on receive, so that can be switched out on transmit. For a very basic CWQRP rig, that type of switching may be all you need. Switching the antenna from receiver to transmit, and the power from receive to transmit. But in this circuit, there's a little bit more. You'll notice the crystal filter is switched between different pins of the NE602s, depending on whether you're in transmit and receive mode. The signals go in different directions, depending on whether you're on receive or transmit. This particular IC operates at the intermediate frequency of 8.867 MHz. On transmit, the signals go from the microphone amplifier and that chip's local oscillator in this direction, through the crystal filter that way. It then goes to the other NE602, which is used to convert it to your desired 7 MHz transmit frequency. Whereas on receive, the signals go the other way, from left to right. The 7 MHz is mixed in the first NE602 with your local oscillator, it comes down to your IF of 8.867 MHz and goes to this NE602, which is the product detector. Just to recap, on transmit, the signal goes that way. On receive, it goes that way. And so you need some switching of the NE602 connections on the crystal filter so that the crystal filter is connected to the right pins at the right time. This relay only needs to accommodate small signals, so it can just be a small printed circuit board mounted relay. And the connections here need to be very short, as we are carrying RF, so I'd suggest mounting this relay right next to the crystal filter and near these NE602s. But relays aren't the only method. Diodes, transistors and ICs can also be used for switching. That does it electronically. It may use a few more parts, but it could be more reliable than just mechanical relays. It's often also cheaper. A common IC used for that purpose is the 74HC4066. There are, there are, however, other parts of the circuit. I do use transistor switching in other parts of the circuit. The BC548 I added here was a design I got from I do use transistor switching in other parts of the circuit. The transistor you see here, a BC548, has 12 volts added in the transmit mode. I do use transistor switching elsewhere in the circuit. This is the receiver front end part, a tuned circuit and the NE602 that the receive signal is coupled into. Acting on some ideas from Eric ZL2BMI, I added a transistor, a BC548 NPN transistor. When I apply 12 volts to the base of this transistor via the 10K resistor, it effectively shorts this point to earth. That's useful because we're not needing to use this part of the circuit in transmit mode. The idea was passed on to me by Eric ZL2BMI, who's used it to great effect in his miniaturized transceiver projects. Another area where I'm using a transistor switch is the receive muting circuit. That helps to overcome the problem that a lot of simple QRP rigs have. That is, when you go from receive to transmit, there's a horrible clunk. It's particularly objectionable if wearing headphones. When you switch the transistor on, by applying DC to the base through a 1.5K resistor, that effectively turns the transistor on, putting a short circuit across the input of the audio amplifier, thus muting the receiver. The connection you see here going to the base is 12 volts on transmit. Only three components, but makes the radio a lot more pleasant to use. Critical to the success of this transceiver is the VXO arrangement, which is fairly critical, 
and requires a bit of cut and try. I'm using two 16 MHz crystals in parallel. That's the Super VXO and gives you at least double the tuning range possible compared to if you're using a single crystal. The inductance in series with a crystal is very critical. If it's too small, you won't get much of a tuning range, and if it's too much, then you might find the crystal oscillator loses lock or it drifts very badly. So you'll need to cut and try to get the right values. In this case, I'm using commonly available molded RF chokes, two in series. I could have a variable capacitor here, and if you've got a variable capacitor and enough room in the box, that's what I would suggest you use. But in this case, lacking space and wanting tuning with a potentiometer, I used three 1N4004 diodes instead. They operate as varactor diodes, changing in capacitance as the voltage to them is varied. The tuning control is a potentiometer, which at one end is connected to 12 volts, the other end to earth. So the voltage on the center pin varies as you turn the potentiometer. That gives you a useful frequency range. Of course the success of this depends on if you can get an IF and local oscillator combination that provides a suitable addition or difference that puts you in the desired part of an amateur band. In this case 16 minus the IF of 8.867 MHz was perfect. Another combination you could use on 7 MHz is 12 MHz and 4.915 MHz, though that will put you a little bit lower in the band. Some NE602 based transmitters don't bother with an audio amplifier stage for the microphone. They assume that if you're using an electric element, there's enough output to correctly drive the NE602. When I first built this rig, that was the arrangement I had. No microphone amplifier transistor. I was able to get sufficient power output when I shouted into the microphone, and I got a few contacts on the air, but the signal reports were nowhere near as good as I would have expected. In fact, they were inferior to double sideband QRP gear I was then also using. As soon as I put in the microphone amplifier, the reports improved a lot. It's just a simple one transistor amplifier, nothing special about it. When I first built this rig, I had the LM386 audio stage going straight from the NE602. That provided sufficient audio if in a quiet room. However, it wasn't quite enough when I was portable. What I did was add a one transistor audio preamp inserted just before the volume control. That provided a useful increase in gain. However, I found there was quite a bit of high frequency hiss that was quite unpleasant. I sorted that out by putting a 22 nano capacitor across the output. That deadened the sound and made it much more pleasant to listen to. It's effectively a crude low pass audio filter. One of the most important settings in an SSB transceiver is the setting of the carrier frequency. The carrier frequency must be set at the right point with respect to the band pass of the IF crystal filter. Otherwise, your transmission and reception will be distorted. If you want upper sideband signals, then your carrier oscillator must be below the band pass of the crystal filter. That way, the filter will pass the upper sideband only. Similarly, if you want lower sideband, you need the carrier oscillator to be a little bit above the band pass of the crystal filter then it will pass the lower sideband only. Amateurs on 7 MHz normally transmit and receive lower sideband. You might instinctively think that this sideband generator part of the transmitter should also be lower sideband. But that's not necessarily so. It depends on the mixing process that you're using. In this case, we're using a 16 MHz local oscillator and an 8.867 MHz intermediate frequency. That intermediate frequency is subtracted from the 16 MHz to provide your 7 MHz transmit frequency. Because it's subtracted, the sideband is inverted, which means that we need to generate an upper sideband signal in this stage for it to come out 
as a lower sideband signal on 7 MHz. As we need to generate an upper sideband signal here, we need this crystal to be lower than the bandpass of the crystal filter we're using. And to get a crystal to be lower in frequency, you need to put inductance in series with it, which is exactly what you're seeing in this circuit. Again, there's a lot of cut and try. The crystal has to be on frequency within 1 or 200 Hz for you to get an acceptable SSB signal. If it's off frequency, your signal will be very high pitched and hard to tune in, or very muffly and also hard to tune in. If you're experienced in monitoring SSB signals, you can do those sorts of adjustments by ear. Or you can use a mobile phone that has an audio spectrum analyzer app, as I demonstrated in a previous video. In my case, with 8.867 MHz crystals, I needed the carrier on 8.8631, only 4 kHz below and easily shiftable by adding some series inductance. Bandpass filters. Although you can make transceivers without them and use broadband circuitry throughout, it's good practice to have some narrow selectivity determining elements in parts of the circuit. That improves your receiver's ability to pick up signals without getting interference from image signals and the cleanliness of your transmitter's output. Here's a single tuned circuit on the input of a receiver. A good rule of thumb on 7 MHz is that 4.7 microhenry in parallel with 100 picofarads will resonate on the 40 meter amateur band. The 4.7 microhenrys in this case is an RF choke. To provide some coupling, such as from an antenna connection, you can just wind some thin enameled copper wire over the body of the RF choke. Three or four turns is usually okay. To make it tune 7 MHz, you can provide a trimmer capacitor which can be used to peak in conjunction with another capacitor which gives you 100 picofarads or thereabouts. A similar arrangement is used in the transmitter bandpass filter. Again this is tuned to 7 MHz using 4.7 microhenry RF chokes. Because the NE602 is a fairly high impedance, I've used a coupling capacitor rather than have a winding over the coil. This has been a look at the circuitry of a simple HF SSB transceiver. It's not a constructional project, but I'd encourage you to look at other people's designs to see how they've solved their problems. More often than not, there's different solutions with different performances and different trade-offs. You may have to go through several other people's to find one that's right for you.